Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on the um, Rural Mental Health Learning Communities uh, webinar. We have these every other month, um, and we're happy to have you join us uh, today. This is Shannon Robshaw with the TA Network. Um, my co-lead for the Rural Mental Health Learning Community is uh, Matt Buckman, who's also on the line and will be facilitating um, the conversation with our experts today. Those are email addresses there, and Sarah Warner also helps support the Rural Mental Health Learning Community. Um, we would welcome any feedback that you have. We've got a short, very short survey at the end of the webinar. We ask you, please, um, we really would appreciate you taking just a couple of minutes and filling that out and giving us some feedback. It, it helps us. Um, we would also uh, welcome any direct communication back to Matt or myself in terms of content areas that you're interested in that we might should look at covering and um, you know, finding additional resources or having additional webinars. Um, we're always looking for topics that folks are interested in. So we would welcome your, your uh, input on that. So again, thank you for being here today. And we want to get started with, um, with a quick little poll just so we understand who all is participating in the conversation this afternoon so we can understand better maybe what some of your particular interests would be. So if you could, you could check one of these boxes, um, the organization, uh, your organization can best be described as what? Take just a couple of minutes so we'll get a sense of who, who, who all is on the call. One, one or two more seconds. Really, really would appreciate knowing who all we've got. Seems like we're getting some private providers, mental health agencies, some other, and I see we see that in the in the box. Um, substance substance use disorder, mental health therapist from Philadelphia. Clinical advisor, New York, great in the other category. All right, I think probably we can go ahead and close that poll. Family organizations are represented. That's always good to see. All right, terrific. Um, and if you all could just the second poll, just to let us know what your role is with your organization, we would appreciate that having that information as well, please. If y'all could just check the box, it fits the best. Or specify differently in the chat box would be great. It's like direct service providers, other again, wraparound access coordinator, okay, great. Project director, one, just one project director. It's kind of surprising. Usually we have a lot of SAMHSA grant project directors on the line. Family support providers, researcher, academician, great. Well, we didn't get, most of y'all did not respond, so we really don't know who you are, but we do appreciate those of you that did. So, um, so thank you for that. So let's, I think we'll just jump right in. Um, and Tiara, my arrows have gone away. So yes, so I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Rick and to Angela and ask them to please introduce themselves and go ahead and get started with the presentation. Thank you both very much for um, being willing to present today. And we will take questions as we go in the public chat box. Um, and so we, we will try to pull those out as we go, and we'll also try to have time at the end. And myself and, um, and Matt will help facilitate that, that Q&A session. So Rick and Angela, if y'all want to go ahead and get started. Sure. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll let Angela introduce herself briefly. Um, I'm Rick Shepler uh, from the Center for Innovative Practices at Case Western Reserve University. And um, we also run a learning community on co-occurring disorders for the training uh, network. 
Um, and we're very pleased today to offer some, you know, information on the impact uh, of opiates on, on the family. Joining me today is Angela Riviere. Hi, I'm Angela LaRiviere. I have worked in the state of Ohio for the last uh, 23 years working with youth in poverty um, from all over Ohio, both rural and urban. Um, I also have personal lived experience growing up in a family with addiction issues, um, both from rural Ohio, one side, and the other side from rural Pennsylvania. Um, so I really, these issues that we're talking about today has affected me personally as a family member and a primary caregiver. I, my current role is working with youth who are multi-systems, who have issues both with addiction and with mental health through Youth Move and also through a poverty prevention program called Youth Empowerment Program. Thank you, Angela. And I think you guys are going to love her, and um, she's a great resource for all of us. Uh, so I'm going to do um, some slides to get going um, and just kind of set the frame uh, for today's discussion. Um, as many of you know, obviously, you know, we have opiate addiction has quickly become a national crisis, um, and overdose deaths um, have overtaken those from car accidents, which is, I think, very significant from ages 25 to 54. Uh, in 2016, it's estimated that over 11 million people misused uh, prescription pain medications and almost a million used heroin and over 2 million experienced an opioid use disorder. Uh, young adults 18 to 25 comprised uh, the largest percentage of those misusing opioids. So, you know, this is a key population that we all serve, um, and it's the largest uh, percentage of uh, opioid misuse. A few charts from the CDC, um, this one from uh, 2017. Um, so, you know, they're always about a year behind when you see the charts posted. Uh, but what you can see here is uh, an increasing amount of deaths by involving any opioid uh, over the last, you know, 18 years. Uh, last, and, and it was up to 47,000 and change um, in 2017, which is quite significant, obviously. Putting that in perspective, in 2016, um, there were a total of 63,000. Uh, 600 overdose deaths from from, medic, from drugs or medication, and opiates uh, and opioids uh, was about two thirds of that. <clears throat> uh, what that means is, from 1999 to 2017, um, overdose deaths related to any opioid uh, use rose by 591 percent, which is absolutely striking. Um, most common drugs used in terms of the opiates were heroin, fentanyl, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and methadone. This is a chart, a chart that shows the highest concentration of um, drug overdose uh, mortality across the United States. You can see a pocket in the Midwest with Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. You can see another pocket in the Northeast with Maine, um, Massachusetts, Delaware, Maryland, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island having the highest level of overdose mortality due to opioids. Um, there's multiple impacts of opioid addiction. Um, it doesn't just refer to the deaths associated with the use of opioids. And really what we want to talk about today is what is the impact also on families? So there's a wide range of, of struggles of those using and abusing opioids. Um, they have multiple impacts on families. Uh, these impacts include criminal justice involvement, adverse effects on mental health conditions, poor living conditions, and damaged uh, relationships.
And when you see your name, Angela, on a slide, <laughs> I'll let you jump in a little bit. <laughs> I got it, Rick. Okay. So some of the work um, that we've been doing in Ohio is looking at the impact specific to Ohio, but not um, unlike the other states that Rick mentioned, is what we're seeing is a big increase in stress on the child welfare system particularly, but also other systems. And what we see and what we know is that, that there's been a 62% increase in Ohio um, just for children in custody who have been placed with relatives and what that stress comes with families. Um, what we don't see in those statistics is other families um, who are receiving children as a result of the addiction and the epidemic, um, and also due to deaths where relatives just take in the, the children of those families without going through the child welfare system. So they're not officially involved. Um, the cost has increased across the board, particularly in Ohio. Um, most of the cost has can be tracked directly to the drug-related cases. By the end of 2016, children in foster care had risen over 10% um, due to drug abuse from parents, and 70% of children in Ohio under the age of one had a parent using opioids or, or heroin. Most, most children entering the system were at younger ages, and the system was too stressed really to um, intervene on cases with older youth. And we have done some focus groups and discussion groups with those older youth that, to see what their perspective is on the impact on them. So some of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, the parent behavior, which um, if you're working in this field, you see that we have more and more absent parents they had extended time seeking drugs and being outside of the family. Um, we, have, we see a lot of trauma both on the user side and how it's impacting the children in those families. And um, they're just giving up on any housing stability is a big issue, but also caring for the family unit, whether it's the children, older youth, or other adults in the family. And the impact on children um, of all ages, I would argue, is the abandonment, the neglect, the lack of supervision, anxiety and fear, the lack of food, all of these things that you could imagine, um, exposure to other non-safe situations. We have a lot of youth um, who talk about being taken into drug houses or uh, being left at strangers' houses while their parents are using. Um, and also for our older youth, the responsibility of the family in running the household has come on to them, um, and they're falling developmentally behind. So some of the service providers that we have talked with and looking at these things has indicated that there's a huge stress on the school system particularly in rural areas where there aren't other services, that school becomes the primary location for the youth to have food or safety, um, even if they're not verbalizing it, because there's a culture of, of protecting their parents. Um, but definitely teachers and school personnel are seeing that impact. So that Impact comes um, on the opposite side of school absence, absences um, and also those youth who are, ten, are tending to turn to using drugs just as their parents because that's their learned behavior and we're seeing culture, a culture of youth using drugs um, because that's what they know on how to deal with their situation. Um, they're more readily acting out the behaviors of their parents. So with some of those discussion with those particular youth, for instance, um, 
had a youth from a family um, who's primarily Southern Ohio roots and poverty who's multi-generational youth came from a grandmother using prescription, um, in this case it was Vicodin, the mother being addicted to prescription Vicodin, and when this youth was starting at 12 years old, was getting made fun of and having a lot of bullying going on at school, mostly because of poverty and neglect was having anxiety about attending school. And so the mother and the grandmother started giving her Vicodin to bribe her to go to school so that she could deal with the issues at school. And that youth is now 24 years old and has been addicted to heroin and everything else and has put herself into place into treatment several times but cannot seem to get out of her addiction. So in the youth voice, I'm going to take a minute. I mean, you can see the slides. Um, some of the things that youth have said is they feel like they are held responsible for any of the activities going on within the family. Because if they go to school and they act out, or they go to school and they're tired, or they go to school and they can't control their anger or their depression, that they're getting blamed and punished. and they. They feel like their, their self, their siblings, and their peers um, are really taking the impact of the punishment and consequences of the adult actions, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, so one, I think the main takeaway, no matter what county youth I've worked with, has, they've all expressed this. My mom is high or drugged out, and she won't go to meetings, or she won't help me with my homework, or my dad is abusive at home, and then I'm tired or angry when I go to work, whichever parent it is. And then when they go to school, they just, they're just they checked out. They, they just don't want to be there. They don't want to participate. And then they're getting truancy charges or they're getting put into behavioral classes or they are getting recommended for um, medication or treatment and they feel like the adults are not being punished. So one of the counties um, particularly that I wanted to touch on with the youth was Vinton County, Ohio. And to just give you a little snapshot of Vinton County, there's 13,000 people in Vinton County. In 2015, there were 105 doses of opiates um, prescribed per person for that year. That's the, like Rick said, you can pull data. It's a, it's a few years behind. I realize that's, some, that's four years ago. What's disturbing is, of all the counties where they've improved, Vinton County has not improved. And until last year, Vinton County did not even have a grocery store. They got their first grocery store last year. So if you think about that, they've had access to all of this medication and no food until last year. So the youth that I work with in Vinton County were outlining some things that um, maybe we hadn't thought about. They have little access to emergency services. So from, from 12 to 17-year-olds to express that they sometimes have to be um, the person that administers Narcan and um, saves their and, and several of them had talked about saving their relatives from overdose death while they waited for emergency services, sometimes up to 45 minutes before emergency services could get to them. Um, and they talked about also, along with youth from three other rural counties, talked about the need for more police officers because there wasn't enough funding in their counties. And I think that was significant because 
People think of the relationship between youth and police as negative, but in these cases, the youth that were working in these groups really had a positive sense about the potential of police officers in a community. Um, another community, Highland County, which is still southern Ohio, but it's southwest, a little more southwestern Ohio, um, the youth talked about they had cut down to where they had one sheriff and on duty at any time, and there was no way for that sheriff to make them feel safe because it couldn't be everywhere. Um, so they really felt that the police were a safety um, and necessary part of their community that wasn't necessarily happening in their rural community is getting enough officers to patrol the drug activity. Um, all of the youth across the board talked about broken family relationships and trust issues, but actually um, were really protective of their parents. So most youth I work with like really don't speak out enough because they don't want any more negative stereotypes or um, stereotypes or point of views on their family. So they didn't they don't want any stigma. They're they're tired of being that family. Um, there's emotional, financial, time, housing drain, dealing with other relatives. So a lot of them were talking about even if they go into relative placement, there's so much use across the board um, that some of the relatives are also addicted and it might be a slightly better situation but it not always and that there's just a real stress on grandparents um, because there are so many grandparents that are taking in children whose, whose parents have OD'd or addicted. So in the broader impact in all of those social services, particularly for the groups we're talking about with child welfare and schools, um, they all need to be working together. And I think for the families, the youth, and the providers that we were working with, um, that's what they were looking at. Rick, I don't know if you want to add anything there. I'm going to stop and just let you add any of your thoughts at this point. Yeah, OK. Thanks. Um, so, you know, as you know, within a system of care, um, when we're trying to be the helpers, if you will, uh, and provide the help, um, you know, there's a, rep, there's, there's a ripple effect on, on the epi epidemic. And so we saw a, a, an amazing amount of stressors actually on the child welfare system. Um, and uh, but also on you know how do we get help to these families and to these children uh, and they could be at their home one day and another home another day uh, and from a mental health perspective it also became difficult in terms of following and tracking and helping um, and really there's this is the kind of an epidemic that all the systems have to work together on um, to be effective uh, and that's why something like intensive care coordination or wraparound would be probably the best tool in our toolbox to help organize um, all of that. So when we think about, you know, how we partner for recovery, um, you know, I'm thinking about the main areas that, that we would need to focus on. And maybe you even think about this in terms of wraparound life domains. Um, you know, we would need to look at First of all, is the youth safe? Is the family safe? What are the major, um, you know, first of all, we, we want to prevent any further trauma. Uh, we also want to pre prevent, um, you know, serious harm as well from, you know, either um, suicide ideation um, or family violence or the criminal activity that could put ch children at risk. So part of what we have to do is come up with a very good um, plan for safety for the youth, but also the family. Um, it's often times that the youth may be placed somewhere else, and so we have to talk about family connectedness. Um, and so what does that plan look like, even though the mother or the father may be addicted? Um, 
and not able to care for their um, children, that doesn't mean that the children don't want a relationship with their parents. And so what does that relationship look like so that, um, you know, the, the, it, it's, there's some sort of ongoingness for them? Um, as we said earlier, this is a community ownership. Um, you know, as a community and even nationally, you know, um, this is something that was caused um, in many ways um, uh, by what happened with some of the pharmaceutical companies. And um, so how do we own this as a community and help the families that are, that are very much at risk? Um, and I know that was a little political, so I will just say right now, um, the statements made by Rick Shepler are Rick Shepler's only and not that of SAMHSA or the training network. And I hear laughter, good. Um, youth supports are going to be needed, family support. So what's the support network look like when there's opiate addiction in a family? Um, to also have realistic expectations uh, for recovery. I think, you know, Angela said it well earlier, this young person had been in and out of treatment. She's still addicted at age 24. What we know is that persons um, addicted to opiates and other um, heavier drugs um, takes at least nine years um, for half of them to reach one year of sobriety, okay? And that's after multiple treatment attempts. This is not a short-term fix. Um, and I think recovering from opiate addiction is one of the hardest ones. So um, we need to have realistic expectations of what the struggle is. Um, and if it takes nine years or if it takes even longer than that, what does that mean for those family relationships over that period of time? And that's really one of the reasons we want to talk about family connectedness because that doesn't mean that they go away forever, the parents. Um, and they may be in and out of treatment and doing well at times and not doing well at times. Um, so what is the family connectedness plan? Ongoing treatment, and, and it may be more than one treatment attempt. Um, and as Angela said, there's a lot of poverty uh, and basic needs that are unmet. So you can start to see some of the complexity of the community response. Um, and no one system or one, one agency can be all of that to the youth and the family in this kind of a situation. Um, so recovery from opiate addiction requires systemic solutions and community mobilization. Um, we need to share the burden to help families get better. Um, it can't just be the substance abuse or the mental health system. It needs to be the total um, community system. Community partnership on behalf of the entire family is necessary. Um, and I think that really means drug, probably the key players could be drug court, family dependency treatment court, um, ch child protective services, uh, extended family, relative placement, along with mental health substance use services, um, along with respite, along with mentors. Um, again, as I said earlier, I think high fidelity wraparound process um, is the best tool in our toolkit to bring together these diverse um, helping partners, uh, especially over time, because again, as we said earlier, this doesn't, you know, um, get better quickly. Uh, and then peer and recovery supports for both the the, the addicted family members as well as the youth um, in those families. So covering all the bases. Um, so. You know, just repeating and adding a few more here, uh, shelter and housing. Uh, Angela said, you know, the schools play a major role in terms of just sometimes just even getting the kids getting food. Um, what are the benefits for the, for the family members? Do they have the benefits to receive the treatment? What are the child developmental needs and how far behind um, do they fall, as Angela had said earlier? There could be legal support needs that need to be addressed. Um, and, and so how do we help the family with um, their legal support? Um, there's a lot of family finding involved and, you know, oftentimes we're looking for who is the support family to raise the children. Um, 
and is, you know, I, I think the first thing we want to do is look at extended family relatives um, support systems. Uh, so there's a lot of that um, so that the child can remain in their community with friends and family. And then there's a the whole physical health um, domain that we need to address, and, and oftentimes that could be related to um, transmitted diseases from IV drug use, like HIV, hepatitis um, C, et cetera. Rick, can I add something there to the physical health needs? Yeah. Um, so when we were just, just because we were, well, just because I pulled out Benton County and remember those statistics of there's only 13,000 people um, in Benton County and no grocery stores till this past year, um, they are in the top 5% CDC risk for HIV and Hep C. So, wow. Yeah. So, thanks. Sure. Yeah, sure. All right. <clears throat> so I think, you know, when we, when we are presented with such complex and difficult situations, um, I think it's easy to, for the first response to be a judging response. Um, and I think that what we have to do is figure out our ways to validate and value every family story um, and every family situation. Um, because I think, for me, if there were generations of poverty in my family and generations of drug abuse, uh, if there was no grocery store in my community growing up, um, how well would I be doing, right, generations of trauma? So I think the first step is to figure out how we honor the family story and the family journey and to appreciate that the family is doing the best they can, um, given their current abilities, life circumstances, and frankly, just being addicted. Um, how do we honor their family expertise? Um, I would, you know, I, I had a, a colleague of mine that um, was addicted to um, crack cocaine, um, and she raised her children, and they never left the home. Um, and I found it very interesting. I, I thought, geez, you know, um, that's a kind of a difficult thing. And what she said to me was, look, I, I knew that I needed to – I, I needed to restrict my use to certain times. I needed to make sure I met their needs. Um, and there was nobody else that knew my kids better, and they needed to be with me. Um, and so that was, you know, she was telling me the story after she had been, you know, sober for many, many years. Um, but how do we honor the family expertise, even sometimes when the family members are still addicted? Uh, it doesn't mean they can't provide something. Um, even if it's just information for the, part of the helping of the kids. Um, as always, you know, how do we understand and value the unique beliefs and values and customs, um, languages, abilities, traditions, and life experience of each family we serve? Um, and I guess most importantly, uh, how do we hold on to the hope for this youth and this family until they can hold the hope themselves? So how do we foster that? foster a positive future um, while they're struggling and while they're, you know, they're, they're getting better. Uh, and that's a, that's a difficult one when it gets extended over time because we start losing our hope as well. Um, and so we need to find our ways to sustain the hope in our own minds for them. Um, and, of course, we need to be culturally mindful and, and respectful of the family. Um, okay, so for these families to be successful and these youth, you know, we need to be talking about identifying and mobilizing a safety net of supports. Um, if you've done wraparound for any period of time in your community, this should be, you know, very familiar to you. Um, think comprehensive support response. Um, so it can't just be one support. It needs to be multiple, you know, a safety net, if you will, of supports. Um, build supports for the youth the addicted parents, and the extended helping system. So opioid, opioid addiction burns out helping systems. Uh, and the helping system itself, which could be grandparents, it could be aunts and uncles, it could be neighbors, um, 
you know, they've reached out and they were in a different place in their life when, you know, they were presented with this new situation, which is now I, I get to raise more kids. Um, so how do we support them? And how do we look at, you know, what could also be burning them out? And, and so, and, and I don't think our systems are all geared to, for example, providing financial support to extended families when they, when they jump in and, and start helping. So that's a bit of a conundrum. Um, so, and think about it, network of supports to avoid team burnout. Hey, Rick. Uh, this is Angela. Some of the things that the youth had mentioned in terms of supporting them um, with their families, if I just can go back for just one second. Um, Sorry. In in those groups, we had we had um, youth give us some suggestions of what they needed to be supported, and I think we also have to put in there is that how we view those youth because they may be only twelve or thirteen or fourteen, but they have been put in a role of a primary caregiver to their siblings or to their parents, and they need to be included in the treatment plan and in, um, in the information of what's happening because I think it's our tendency as helpers to go in and say, it's not your place to be in this conversation because it's not age appropriate or because you're the child in the situation. We have to respect that they have largely been the adult in the situation regardless of what age they are. And I had a 12-year-old that came to a session that was talking about having to care for his parent for so long and that he felt that there were a lot of programs in schools, but the programs that existed in schools, um, such as any drug-related drug prevention programs, maybe DARE or something like that, was really, in his words, kindergarten level compared to the level of what they see when they go home or what they're dealing with in their families and that he felt his himself and his peers needed some better training around what the realities were in their community versus what the theories are of their age appropriateness. Does that make sense to you? I thought it was I thought it was really good from a twelve year old. And he didn't talk the whole time because he was the youngest one in the session. And then he just had that really great and powerful insight to what curriculum in schools and, and how service providers look at a child because they are children versus the conflict with their, their home reality. Beautiful. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a question. and. Um, the uh, from Zenda Stevenson, thank you. The unique problem that a small community has is that there are no natural supports um, that are healthy, They're, that aren't addicted also to help the family maintain or obtain sobriety. More of a comment that in many small communities there might not be those additional extended family supports to be helpful. Uh, they too also might be addicted. Thank you for that, Zenda which really puts more stress on, you know, especially in a small community, what is the system response? Uh, and it's partially one of the reasons we're seeing such an uptick um, in Child Protective Services taking custody and trying to figure out, okay, first of all, where's our budget to take care of this uptick? And number two, where we put all these kids? Um, risk management and um, well, really interesting, this is just an aside, uh, you know, I noticed that Ohio was a dark green, um, and Ohio also um, had the least amount of money um, in its regular state budget for um, child protective services and child welfare until this year um, after doing lots of, not me, but lots of advocacy was done, and because of the opioid crisis, they actually um, added another $30 million, and this was actually just yesterday. To the, to the child welfare budget. Um, but again, that usually means we're putting kids somewhere. Um, always not the best response, but it is a response. 
uh, risk management and safety enhancement approach. So again, when we're involved as helpers, what I think the way that I view this is that there has to be a plan for risk and, and support safety, um, addressing family trauma and safety needs, um, personal and physical safety, understanding the role of trauma and intimate partner violence in substance abusing couples, uh, which is fairly common. Um, being open to discussion about what about a needle exchange program. Um, monitoring for suicide ideation as what we know with folks with co-occurring disorders is they are m much more at risk for uh, completing suicide. Um, and there's all kinds of risk related to procuring drugs, as Angela mentioned earlier, and, and oftentimes you know, they might even take the children. Um, so there's all kinds of risk and safety management issues around those issues. Talked about family connectedness. Um, you know, there's a possibility of employing a family finding approach, which um, Child Protective Services often uses, um, but also to consider alternate family options like the faith community, um, concerned others, neighbors. Um, and I think we almost have to consider a collaborative parenting approach. Um, how do we do, you know, we have to think outside of the box. Um, so if somebody from the faith community steps up, then what supports are there for them? Um, what's the family connectedness with that new family? Um, and how do we come together to collectively parent the youth uh, in a way that keeps them safe and developmentally growing? Um, I'm going to talk about um, evidence-based treatments for a minute because I'm supposed to. So there. Um, but I want to get back to talking with Angela about the family experience. Um, but we do need to assist with linkage to evidence-based treatments for the addicted family members. Um, the one that is supported most and has the most evidence is medication-assisted treatment, MAT. Uh, but along with that, there are some very good trauma therapies that would be recommended, like seeking safety. Um, Family-focused interventions seem to do really well. Um, and it's usually the combination of medication-assisted treatment along with um, some sort of psychodynamic treatment that seems to be the best, keeping in mind that um, opioid addiction is a chronic relapsing condition. Um, so real, realistic expectations, and it, this is an over-time um, intervention. So there's no magic uh, bullet here. Uh, just some of the medications that are around. Um, so naloxone is around, uh, strong opioid antagonist. It's administered to counter an overdose. Um, and it's quite short acting, and I think this is what's getting put out there, I think, for free in many places um, for families to get a hold of and for first responders to have as well. Uh, and then medication-assisted treatments, there's three classes. One we just mentioned, the antagonist, um, and then methadone, which we probably are most familiar with, um, and then uh, suboxone, um, which is a partial, well, I want to get into all those words, but it's, a, it's another uh, medication-assisted treatment that is actually probably more commonly used right now for some of the opioid addictions. Um, so there's multiple different um, types uh, of way of assisting the person in getting better, um, but these are very specialized, and they need to be done usually through some sort of very um, link to a credentialed um, provider for medication-assisted treatment in your area. MAT is targeted to decrease overdose death, decrease infectious disease spread, increase treatment retention, and decrease criminal activity. These are some of the positive outcomes that, when it's used, um, happen. Um, and as I've been talking about um, throughout the training uh, webinar this, this afternoon, um, you know, Realistic expectations is, is critically important. This is a chronically relapsing 
disease. Um, recovery also is ongoing, and support for recovery is long-term and ongoing. Um, so we need to educate our system partners about all of these things. Um, and as I said earlier, recovery takes multiple treatment attempts over multiple years. Um, one kind of a general approach to use regardless is motivational interviewing, which I just wanted to mention because it is also another evidence-based approach to helping um, persons who are addicted. And I want to end with a few comments in terms of um, hopefulness, which if you know me is hard for me to do, but I'm going to be that way. <laughs> um, I can take it for you, Rick, if you want. Yeah, no, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hopeful, hopefulness from youth and families that we spoke with um, is that recovery is possible if they have the right supports. And looking at some communities that have created opiate task force or um, other community groups that are coming together to look at this problem has started to generate hope in communities, and I hope we don't lose that momentum. Again, I wanted to point out that most of the youth, even the surprising, um, worked with a group of juvenile youth in the juvenile justice system, indicated positive comments about law enforcement and their role on how to build relationships with the community. Um, all youth seem to think about the safety. The child welfare system, and I think finally with this crisis, at least in Ohio and then hopefully in other states, are starting to fund programs that are needed within the child welfare system. And if we keep those discussions open with them about, as Rick indicated, how to support extended family members and also community groups to be empowered to work together um, to support the children in these families. In the education system, um, we could provide a lot more training for teachers and also looking at things that we could do that would be low cost, as the 12-year-old mentioned, as simple things as looking at current curriculums and, the, and how we have those discussions and bring outside resources into schools. Um, if outside resources are available, as we know in a lot of communities, schools are really all they have. So um, just supporting our education system, looking at the physical and behavioral health care issues, um, that means to our families and youth being indicated of treating the entire family, not just the addict, not just the child who's acting out, but um, getting that message across that we do need to look at the whole family dynamic and what the needs are going on across the board as much as we can. Um, there's been a lot of, of positive um, changes within juvenile justice to do diversion programs, treatment therapy, and looking at trauma instead of just punishing um, criminal behavior. Um, so there seem to be a lot of hope, particularly with youth that I've worked with, around the role of the juvenile justice system, um, which is also the, the adult, and also in the adult criminal justice system, having more drug courts and intervention and treatment options on those um, nonviolent offenses that are drug-related or mental health-related. Here in Ohio, some of our counties also do mental health courts. Um, early childhood providers, um, just getting information out to them, and then, of course, any other child serving systems. But we think, you know, as the information gets out there to those helpers in the community, um, that we could look at these recommendations for both the evidence-based practices that we know, um, implementing, as Rick said, wraparound, uh, our youth are big supporters of wraparound here in Ohio, and looking at getting as many people to the table as possible so you have a better chance of building a foundation for those youth to progress positively and move forward and for those families to stay um, 
more stable and intact. I'll turn it back to you, Rick. I think we lost Rick. All right, so it looks like we Oh, I had call. to unmute. Mute. I am oh. so sorry. No worries. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thank you, Angela. I want to just point out some resources that we have available. And um, this is the, um, you know, SAMHSA has a lot of very good resources uh, on opioid overdose. Uh, they have one on pre uh, a prevention toolkit, and there's um, the uh, website for that. Um, the CDC um, has some information on uh, preventing an opioid overdose. Um, very helpful um, to have that as the help, helpers, but also to distribute to the family. There are some tip manuals um, that address things like co-occurring disorders, but also medications for opioid use disorder put out by SAMHSA. Um, and all you would have to do is click on the um, <clears throat> the hyperlink there, um, and then the resources in the, um, the reference section here. When you go to the files, um, what I want you to take a look at is we have the PowerPoint, number one. Um, in addition to the PowerPoint, we have um, more, resource, um, more resources for you, for the helpers, but also the persons addicted to opiates. Um, and then we developed um, some resource tools for helping youth and families affected by opiate addiction that are actually part of a toolkit. Um, and you won't see these anywhere else, um, and they're your, for you to use if you like. Um, but we have a uh, family contextual support map that we, we developed for, for families affected by opioid addiction. Um, we, and it's guided by um, questions that you can ask. Um, and we also have in that toolkit um, a support team helping grid, um, keeping in mind that there are key areas that we need to address for, for, for families who have opioid addiction, and keeping in mind that it's hard to keep it all organized and that teams burn out from helping. Uh, so we need to figure out how to distribute the help. So those are there. Um, we want to make sure you knew about them. Uh, in addition to the PowerPoint. Uh, we want to open it up for questions um, to see if we have any other questions from participants today. And as we wait for questions, I'm going to talk with Angela. Um, so Angela, I guess one of the th questions I wanted to ask, um, because I know you've had uh, you know, your own lived experience, but also worked with many youth and families, um, who have struggled with opioid addiction. Um, what's different now? How is the opioid crisis different than it was maybe 20 years ago? Or maybe it's, it's a similar dynamic, I don't know. Well, I, I would say I think there's a lot more openness around um, mental health in general. Um, for me personally, but also looking at the life lifespan, what we talked about is that cycle of addiction. Um, I had one parent that was addicted and one parent that was severely mentally ill. So as the oldest child was being the primary caregiver for the younger ones, I had absolutely no support at all. And there just wasn't child welfare intervention. I think the child welfare system has improved in terms of their knowledge and intervention in these cases. Um, and probably our families don't see it, but there's been a lot more creative solutions within child welfare that I personally see in terms of um, being flexible and, and not just taking children away. There's more supports for children who are separated from their siblings to be able to connect to them. I think that has a lot to do also with technology. You have cell phones and internet access. Um, it was a lot more scary 
um, when child wel welfare eventually intervened in our situation. I was 18, and the rest of my siblings got separated into different homes. So that was a very traumatic time for all of us because we had no connection to each other. So I definitely will say that the system has gotten better at recognizing the need for siblings to be connected to each other during crisis and trauma, and also for the parents to still have some, um, e even if it's supervised, um, interaction with what's going on while they're receiving treatment because as a, as a kid that's been separated from your, from your parent, um, I think the philosophy used to be that you just take the kid out of the, take, take a child out of the situation and protect them and keep them out of the conversation. But really all that did was just distract them internally, um, worrying about what was happening in that family. So I think I think think that that's been a shift in how we provide services to families and I think that's really good. Um, personally, even in the last five years, I think a lot of that's changed. Um, Rick knows and with everyone else, I've I have been a, a family caregiver to my nieces and nephews because of that cycle of addiction had um, continued with a couple of my sisters. Um, and it was really hard of not having any any support in the community, not being income eligible for things or not being an official child welfare case. So I, I think that conversation is starting to change and we're starting to really recognize the role of extended family members. I think we had a question. Um, yes, we've, we've got a comment and a question um, from Matt. Hi, Matt. Um, I appreciate you all sharing the data needs and resources with inclusion of effective evidence-based practices and the importance of youth voice. Um, do you have any resources you would recommend for public awareness campaigns for mobilizing the safety network or supporting families with addiction disorders? It's a great question. I have to think about that question, Matt. <laughs> well, <laughs> Which, but well, Angela I think, knows. Uh, <laughs> well, for us, I mean, in Ohio, we've created a network and a relationship with Youth Move National, um, generally looking and tapping into other st anti-stigma campaigns and empowerment campaigns for youth who are struggling. Um, with their own behavioral health needs, but also working in those families. Um, we do get a lot. There have been a lot of great resources through SAMHSA and the TA network um, that we have pulled. And we kind of encourage, this, especially our smaller communities that don't have a lot of resources, to look at different campaigns that's going on nationally. Um, in Ohio, we did a, a Crush Labels campaign with a lot of schools where we had we, we made big banners that said Crusher Labels, and, and we had students write out their labels on paper boxes and smash them um, just to say, I'm not these labels that people put on me. Um, that particularly worked really well with our middle school youth, and we had one school district that literally did the activity with 800 students. and. Um, just looking at what's going on with other programs, I think a lot of online resources. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, mostly okay. I think breaking the stigma opens up the gate for them to not be ashamed to talk. And then once you engage them in talking, then they will ask for the information and hopefully that information is available. That's wonderful. Well, and, and this is Shannon, and I really want to thank you both and hope we get some more questions. Um, but that was really um, powerful uh, information that you both shared. And it, it called, you know, for me, when I'm just thinking our, our participants on the phone, you know, the importance of partnering with your local youth organization um, around this particular issue and the insights that can be you know, gained by engaging with with youth um, to to begin try to organize 
uh, community response uh, to the opioid epidemic. And so it's just um, it's interesting to hear about your work, Angela, and, and kind of the consistency of the of the of the perspective that you're getting and the information and the stories that you're getting from your different conversations in different areas. And it makes me think that that we need to be doing more of that, um, more of that, more of that, more intentionally, in other parts of the country as well. I I, um, I actually live in in Northeast Tennessee, um, where we have a lot, lot, lot of this um, problem. We have a lot of um, neonatal um, um, addicted babies coming, you know, born, and that's a big thing too. Also, with child welfare, is trying to keep the babies with their mothers and not being separated at birth or even criminal charges with the mothers. So it's it's a complicated, a complicated issue. And I think that Rick, your observations that it needs to be a community response, not just a single system response. Um, I don't know how to get around that, you know, because there are so many different aspects of it. <laughs> I think we've been dealing with this this issue of silos for a long time. So. Yeah, okay. and, and I think it, it gets even more complicated when you think about that it crosses over the kid in the adult system. And the kid and adult systems don't necessarily talk to each other or understand each other that well. Um, well, so, I like I mean, to I like to leave two takeaways if it's if it's okay about that. What you just said about listening and and dealing with youth, even though I've lived this literally my entire life and worked with youth professionally for the last 25 years, I will say that every time I have a discussion group or a new youth that calls me with the situation or whatever, I really get a lot out of their perspective, no matter how much I know. This that 12-year-old was like, yeah, I get. It was kind of kind of uh, interesting because it was during the government shutdown. So there were 17 young people in that in that rural area discussion group from three counties, and they kept putting on there they were worried about the government shutdown. <laughs> so we had a discussion about that and resources and just making that comment about can can we just encourage a different conversation right now. Can we can we please move on from the, the kindergarten curriculum, as he said? And I thought, well, we're all thinking of these big time solutions, and and this would be immediately helpful to them while we're waiting on funding. Um, there's just always things that will come up that we never thought of, and so the I think the more listening you could do to the youth and the families is is going to be key, and then also acting on those recommendations. So that would be what I would hope everyone would mm -hmm. take out of it. And I would encourage folks to utilize those resources that um, that Rick has provided, in particular the, I, I forget, the, not the list of the links, what did you call it, the family mapping or contextual mapping? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. yeah the family contextual map. Yeah. I'll look up the exact name, hold on a second. Uh, it is called, you know, okay, Family Contextual Support Map. So those tools in particular, I mean, we would love to get some feedback from you all in the field about, you know, how helpful are those and any suggestions for um, for tweaks or, or just feedback to let us know, you know, if that's a, if that's a helpful tool. And there's a, um, you also laid out sort of within that context, I think, Rick, you know, taking that wraparound approach. Um, right to working with the family, and so we would be interested in in getting some feedback on on if those tools are helpful or not. So we we would appreciate you letting us know if you can take a look at those. And and I just want to you know piggyback on 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 the, on the wraparound piece of it. Um, you know when I think about the tools in our 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 mental health or our system of care toolkit, um, I automatically think about what is that, you know, what do we need to do to bring people together, and, and that tool is wraparound. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's beautifully designed for this, actually for this kind of a crisis. Um, 
but we also need then to know how to, when we talk about team building, how do we bring in the adults, you know, treatment providers, the adult aspect of, you know, we're good with the kids system, you know, what about, what do we need in the adult system to also be helpful? Mm -hmm. um, so it could be actually quite a big team. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been great. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in right now, but um, I thought we had put your email addresses on there. Um, but, but if we did not, for Rick and for Oh, there, there we are. they are. Okay, so there's Rick and Angela's email addresses, and thank you for sharing those. So y'all can email them directly with any additional questions that you have, or you know, if you get feedback, want to give some feedback on those tools to directly to Rick, or we would we would love to have that as well. Um, feel free to contact them, and also again, contact um, Matt or myself if you have any additional ideas for other topic areas that you would be interested in us organizing around. Um, and if I don't see any other questions, I'm going to remind y'all to please take the survey. I promise that it only takes a minute or two, but we really would appreciate the feedback. Um, and thank you again, Rick and Angela. That was a great conversation, and we really appreciate you sharing that with us. Well, thank you for having us. Very much appreciated. I'm glad we could share Angela with you as well. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank y'all. Right, thanks.